Good morning and a very warm welcome to the 12th meeting in 2018 of, of the Social Security Committee. I can remind everyone to turn mobile phones and other devices to silence so they don't disrupt the meeting or the broadcasting. Um, we've received apologies today from Jeremy Balfour, MSP, and um, today will be the last appearance in this committee of Mr Tomkins, and I would like to thank him very much for his service to this committee and wish him all the best for his new parliamentary duties. It's a real pleasure to work with you all. Thank you. Our first agenda item is decision to take item three uh, and four uh, in private, and has the committee agreed to do so? Thank you. Agenda item two is um, uh, an evidence session on the Scottish Welfare Fund, and I would like to welcome um, the panel this morning. Um, we have John Dickey, Director of Child Poverty Action Group in Scotland, CPAG, Jules Oldman, Head of Policy and Operations for Homeless Action Scotland, Elodie Minyar, Refugee Integration Services Manage Manager for the Scottish Refugee Council, and Bill Scott, Director of Policy, Inclusion Scotland. And a very warm welcome and thank you to those who have provided briefings for today's meeting. Um, if I could just open by asking, um, asking the panel to look in a crystal ball a little, a little bit and, and just ask them um, what do they see as the challenges and pressures on the Scottish Welfare Fund going forward? Um, and I don't know, I'll, I'll take Mr Dickey first. <laughs> Um, well, I think there are, there are increasing challenges on the fund. Um, there's no question that more and more households and families uh, are facing income crisis, uh, are facing real pressures on their uh, already very limited budgets and too often finding themselves without any money at all, never mind that additional money they need to, to meet uh, exceptional uh, pressures. Um, so we know from all the modelling that's been done by commissioned by Scottish Government, by uh, Institute of Fiscal Studies, increasing levels of poverty expected over the next few years. Um, families under very severe pressures. We already, we're already seeing through uh, our own case evidence um, and through work that we're doing with Poverty Alliance and Oxfam um, through the Menu for Change project, um, increasing numbers of people affected by the, the rollout of universal credit and finding themselves uh, without income um, in part because of the uh, waiting period built into universal credit but also due to administrative uh, problems and, and, and failings uh, associated with universal credit. So increasing pressures on individuals and on families um, and the Scottish Welfare Fund as the safety net there to provide uh, support where people are facing a uh, crisis, facing emergency um, clearly under, uh, likely to, put, to, to be under increasing pressure uh, as a result of that, and al already is. Um, and I suppose we want to make sure that it is, it's been a, a hugely welcome development, the, 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 the creation of the, the, the National Scottish Welfare Fund with national guidance, uh, statutory underpinning, um, in stark contrast to what's uh, happened elsewhere in the UK. But we need to make sure that it's invested in and supported so it's fit for purpose to uh, ensure that it's able to respond to uh, the realities that individuals and families are going to be facing over the next few years. Um, Mr. Scott, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to echo um, a lot of what John just said. Um, I was speaking to a community group in Glasgow on Tuesday night, and they are dreading the introduction of full rollout of universal credit um, because already, uh, amongst those who are uh, subject to un universal credit, they are, they are finding that people are unable unable to manage and also the level of deductions being made from their benefit at around 40% uh, of the total, either to recover um, uh, rent or, uh, in, in some cases, um, sanctions. Um, because of the length of time that they're subject to that, they're less and less able to manage. And the problem is that is if they're giving, given uh, all of the money in one payment, um, they have to keep the rent money otherwise they're evicted. Um, but that means that they may not be able to eat or feed their families. So if they're unable to eat or feed their families, they go for a crisis grant. But then if they use some of the rent money to do that, 
they end up being evicted and then they have to apply for a community care grant and the costs to, the, uh, to local authorities uh, of rehousing somebody that's uh, been evicted are enormous and you know, were estimated uh, you know, between 16 to 20 thousand pounds for each each uh, family so you know there will be increasing pressure on the fund and and we are fearful that that means that because it's a discretionary fund um, you know, increasingly the pressure will be on officials to decide who are the deserving and who are the undeserving poor you know and who gets help and who doesn't get help and, and that puts them in an invidious position you know, of making decisions which have fundamental impacts on people's lives because they're unable to help everybody that approaches the, the Fund for Help. Okay. Hi. Um, we, we support newly granted refugees, so people who have been through the asylum support, which the asylum system, which is a system that has been recognised to be inhuman, isolating and putting people in financial hardship. People, um, when they receive a positive decision and become officially, legally a refugee and become entitled to mainstream benefits, have a 28-day move-on period uh, at the end of which um, asylum support from the Home Office is terminated. So newly granted refugees have only 28 days to have um, to ensure their first payment of benefits. We know from our evidence um, that we've published and that we've brought to this committee two years ago um, that this is not enough for people to have their benefits paid. And that's under the legacy, the legacy benefits. In September, we're going to face the rollout of the universal credit. And I can only echo the concerns of CPAC Scotland and Inclusion Scotland about, you know, the, the, that will increase the destitution of newly granted refugees when we see that, you know, it takes four to six weeks for, the, for benefits to be processed. So what it means is that when the crisis grant is supposed to be an exceptional payment to respond to crisis, it is now used to respond to a planned crisis in a way, that to, to circumstances that we know are happening for every newly granted refugee or almost newly granted refugees. We are very welcoming of the funds, that's got the, the Scottish Welfare Fund that will be made available specifically for reunited families who are also um, facing um, very strong financial hardship. But again, this is the use of a crisis payment to meet the needs, you know, on, you know, non-crisis non needs, I would say, because we know those families will be in such situation. So our, our concerns at Scottish Refugee Council is what can be put in place for, you know, sustainable solution for newly granted refugees, both individuals um, and families, and how can they be supported? How can they get um, access to um, advocacy services as well to enable them to go through that system. All of those needs have been recognised and are included in the new Scott strategy under the Employment and Welfare Rights Action Plan. Um, and so we need, to, we need to work and find sustainable um, solutions. The need for services, um, Scottish Refugee Council runs the Scottish Refugee Integration Service in partnership with the British Red Cross and we assist every newly granted refugees and reunited families. That funding is terminating in October 2018, which matched the rollout of the Universal Credit in Glasgow. So we've got you know, significant concerns on how can this be, you know, how can their needs be met. Uh, Ms. Holden? Um, well, also to, to echo what's been said on universal credit, I, I won't repeat that. Um, we certainly have concerns around it. Um, in addition to what's been mentioned with that, we have concerns um, where people have been self-employed and the, the um, onus upon them to, to really be keeping constant contact with um, the DWP around their credit. So we, um, we do feel that there's going to be a new um, kind of range of people actually who, who are going to be sanctioned or, or kind of within difficulty with, with benefits and, and finances. Um, on a, a slightly more positive note, but does it does have financial implications. Um, we know through HARSAG there's lots of work happening with temporary accommodation. Um, so the hope for that, of course, is that there's a lot of people currently kind of stuck in that bottleneck in temporary accommodation, 
but they're going to be moving into um, permanent tenancies. Fingers crossed. Um, and so, therefore, that has implications on the, the community care grants. I mean, really, the, the difference in somebody being in receipt of a community care grant and that's, that tenancy actually succeeding is massive. Uh, you, we can't underestimate that. Um, so, if we're, we're expecting those numbers to be moving on, there's, what, 10,873 homes just now, um, sort of people in temporary accommodation. If we're, if we're expecting that to, to reduce and those people move into to permanent accommodation, then the community care grant needs to have an element to actually be matching um, those people moving on so that those tenancies can be a, a success. Thank you. Mr McPherson, you wanted to come in. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Just, uh, Bill Scott, I wanted to pick up um, on some of your evidence related to, to what you opened with there. You, you, you talked about the increasing anxiety around delays uh, or uh, anticipated delays with the, the rollout of universal credit. Um, in your evidence, you also spoke about uh, extra pressure on the fund due to increase in the proportion of claimants subject to conditionality and, and sanctions, uh, increase to the average length of sanctions, and also something that's particularly ar arisen in, in my con uh, constituency casework, the imposition of the benefit cap with its particular impact on larger families. I just wondered if you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, you'll, you know, Ben, uh, that um, we've had contact with families in North Edinburgh with disabled children who have been evicted um, due to the uh, benefit cap. And, um, you know, in some instances, um, causing the separation uh, a parent from the uh, child um, because uh, suitable housing couldn't be found uh, in Edinburgh uh, that met the needs of uh, the, ch the child um, you know, by the local authority uh, so they had to go and stay with a relative while their mother was rehoused in Fife uh, and you know, these are the sort of things that are arising due to the benefit cap um, it definitely must be creating additional pressure within the system in those areas such as Edinburgh, Aberdeen and Glasgow where there's quite a high proportion of uh, families affected um, and where rents are higher. Um, so we could see that the, the, that additional pressure feeding through into additional demand, and, and that certainly looks the case as far as Edinburgh is concerned, where it's spent more than three quarters of its budget by the nine month point, and looks as though it's heading for a, an overspend over, over the course of the year. Um, and it's already put in additional funds <laughs> over and above what Scottish Government uh, provides to it to, tr to try and meet that. So it, it does look as though the benefit cap is, is having a, a real effect. And, uh, you know, as I say, it, it, it adds to the other pressures. And in terms of universal credit, it, it is about the increase in conditionality. You already heard it affects self-employed people. It also affects carers. Carers are in a catch-22 situation where if they claim universal credit, which they must do under full rollout, then they cannot work more than 16 hours a week without losing their carer's allowance and their status as carers. But if they work under 16 hours, they're subject to conditionality to increase their hours to over the 16-hour limit. Now that, you know, is, pu is putting carers in an impossible situation. And carers save the state billions of pounds each year by providing unpaid care. And you're putting them in a situation where they are subject to losing money either because they continue to work under 16 hours to provide the care that's needed or they work over 16 hours and lose their carers' allowance and lose all uh, the additional... Uh, entitlements that that brings. So, you know, what do they do? You know, it's impossible um, for them to avoid losing money, I would suggest, un under the system that's been brought in. And it's just not been thought through what the impact on carers would be. Okay. Does anyone else want to come in on that point? I think Ms Mr Adams got a further supplementary. Uh, uh, a quick supplementary. Good morning. Uh, 
I, I just wanted to ask on the back of what Ben McPherson says, every one of you mentioned there at the start that there's pressures on the funds uh, because of uh, universal credit in particular. And uh, is, it, is it not the Scottish Government, with a limited resource, keeps trying to mitigate against these things. But there comes a time where we all have to kind of have a look at where the source problem is. And the source problem is the decisions that are being made by the government in Westminster, which effectively in universal credit is one of the prime examples, is a, a, a callous benefit change that's kind of made, caused devastation in people's lifestyles. So surely when we're having this debate, the whole way of summarising this whole discussion is that yes, there's a responsibility here in this place, but responsibility needs to be taken up by those in Westminster as well, with the fact that they are actually the ones that are causing the human carnage as we speak. I mean, absolutely, so Scottish Government, UK Government need to, to work together and, and, and pressure needs to be brought to bear on the UK Government to ensure that the social security system that it's responsible for is fit for purpose and is providing uh, income and income security for individuals and families in Scotland. So there's absolutely no question we need to keep the, keep the pressure on uh, and ensure that action is taken to fix universal credit, make it fit for purpose uh, and ensure that it provides that financial stability that, that individuals and families need. Um, in the meantime, the reality is it, it, it isn't in too many cases um, and we see increasing numbers of people actually ending up at food banks when actually we have a scheme in Scotland, the Scottish Welfare Fund, established to meet the needs of people facing income crisis. Um, so we need to make the most of what we do have in Scotland in that, in that Scottish Welfare Fund, which is there to meet the needs of those people who are facing an income crisis. The reasons for that income crisis ha have changed over the years and, and, uh, and they'll change uh, um, in relation to the effectiveness of the, the, the overall social security system and wider uh, pressures on family and individual incomes. Um, but we need to make the most of it. It's there to provide support to individuals and families uh, in relation to crisis grants facing facing crisis, and too many are now facing crisis, uh, in part driven by the failings uh, of universal credit or the problems with universal credit and its rollout. So absolutely, we shouldn't take away <laughs> attention from underlying drivers of that income, income insecurity, but at the same time, we shouldn't ignore what we can, we can do here in, in Scotland to uh, invest in uh, and support the, the that devolved bit of the social security system that we have now, the Scottish Welfare Fund, uh, to, to, to provide that safety net, beneath the safety net almost, uh, to ensure that uh, people aren't uh, put at risk uh, and the, the health of them and the, their families isn't put at risk because they have no, no money. And we should, we, we've got an opportunity here to use the, the, the structure of the Scottish Welfare Fund to ensure that uh, we stem the increasing reliance on charitable aid, food banks, uh, as the response to income crisis. Uh, so the more that we can do to support the Scottish Welfare Fund, ensure it's working effectively, invest in it to respond to uh, increasing demand, uh, ensure that its, its value is, uh, at the very least, uh, uprated uh, um, in real terms, but, if, uh, but actually thinking about how can we respond to the fact that we know so many people are ending up at food banks when they could be at getting a crisis grant from the Scottish Welfare Fund, well, let's actually, let's actually use the powers that we do have to invest in that fund. John, I, I'm so, I'm like you. I want to fix a problem. We all came into politics to try and fix uh, problems in our community. But sometimes you've got to say, you know, with the limited resource that we have available to us, mm. if things were done properly with the benefit system down south, we could actually work in tandem, we could get something better. And it's, I'm agreeing with you, effectively, yeah. we need to find a way to make that work. And it gets frustrating for me, and it, no doubt it does for you, working in the front line uh, when you're having to deal with these issues. Absolutely. I suppose there are, there are actually practical things. So there's potential within the Scottish Welfare for Fund, and, and in many local authority areas, that's already happening in terms of ensuring that there are positive relationships with DWP, with other services, to ensure that people, when they come to the Scottish Welfare Fund, are actually getting the support, the advice, uh, the referrals that they need to ensure that they are actually getting the financial support that they're entitled to, that um, mistakes uh, and errors in the uh, the UK social security system are being challenged to ensure that people are getting what they're entitled to and the more we can do to build those links and ensure that when people approach the Scottish Welfare Fund in a crisis they don't just get a crisis grant they get the support they need to put themselves uh, to get the financial support they're entitled to on a more secure and sustainable basis so there's things that can be done at a practical local level to ensure that happens as well as that um, 
at, at national advocacy and campaigning level for us to be ensuring that we do fix the problems with universal credit. To kind of follow on with that, I think we can also think of it as an opportunity to actually be engaging with people that we may not be on in kind of other circumstances, and therefore it gives you um, opportunity for income maximisation. Um, working with people, you can be be looking at, at whole kind of stems of, of other um, prevention work within within their lives and their households. So for actually what what turns out per household or per person to be very small amounts. The opportunities that uh, that that offers you um, is really really large. When sometimes you will never actually meet with that family or that household for any other reason, so that the kind of knock-on effect, the domino effect that that um, allows, then actually um, even with the kind of everything being ironed out with with DWP etc., I don't think we want to lose that as an opportunity um, because it really can enhance people's lives with the knowledge from local authorities and, and what's available in their kind of their actual catchment areas. You know. So, so don't we, we can't lose lose sight of that element of support that's available. Uh, yes, Ms. Minya. Um, just to follow on from that, and that you know the support available and people understanding what their rights and entitlements are is 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 critical. And and we, I know I've already made that point, but I can't stress it enough about how, especially with refugees, people have no idea about what their entitlements are. Um, and they don't even know they can ask for some benefits or for some crisis grant payment, you know, unless they can come to our office and being advised about this. So I think we need, to, when we look at mitigating the impact, we need to think about what kind of resources are required, and not only for refugees, but across the, the country to make sure that people know about their rights and entitlements to that support. Mr. Scott, yeah. Just very briefly to echo that, that, that when we did a straw poll, uh, five people out of about 20 who responded, and it, you know, it was very briefly done, um, said that they'd never heard of the, the Scottish Welfare Fund. And they're on benefits, um, four out of five of them anyway. One's a local councillor. <laughs> uh, but they, they, they didn't know about the fund. And, and, and even a couple of those who did know about the fund said that the only way that they found out was through using a local community group or an advice agency to find out about it. So they didn't know it you know, through the council's own information systems. So I think it's something that definitely needs to be addressed. Uh, Mr. Tompkins, you wanted to come in? You know, I mean, the conversation's moved on a little bit, but I just wanted to go back to something that Bill Scott said a few moments ago, because I think it piqued the interest of a, of a number of us. And it said, I think you said something which I, I don't think I was aware of, which is this 16-hour rule and the conflict between universal credit and carers allowance. Can, can you just explain that one more time so that I've understood it properly, and then I might have a question about it? To receive carers allowance, um, you have to keep your working hours, if, you, if you, you have any work as a carer, you have to keep your working hours under 16 hours a week, otherwise you'll lose entitlement. Conversely, with universal credit, if you work under 16 hours a week, you're subject to conditionality to increase the number of hours to over 16. Um, so the problem is for any carer, and it's not just those in receipt of carer's allowance, it's also those who have a, a nominal entitlement to it, but actually essentially claim um, GSA uh, or income support, um, they can, uh, they're nominally entitled to carers' allowance, but they actually receive uh, the other benefits. But again, they're subject to that 16-hour rule. So that, that they, once they've, they've breached that, they've, lo they've, they've lost their carers' allowance um, and they'd, they'd, sub they'd be subject to a reduction in benefit. Th 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 thank you for explaining that. That's very clear. So carers' allowance is one of the 11 benefits which is being devolved in full. Right. So there's no question here of you know, the Scottish Government being required to mitigate what Mr Adam just described as the carnage of DWP policy. It's being, de it's be it's being, it's being, devolved, it's being devolved in full. You know, carers' allowance is being devolved in full. So that it would be up for, be for the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament to decide if it wishes to continue that 16-hour rule in the new devolved carers' allowance. It would. And, and, and you know, there is, there are already, we've already made strong arguments that, in particular, young carers shouldn't be subject to that rule because it prevents them get, getting um, into the world of work. Because it's also, it doesn't just apply to work, it also applies to education. If you take more than a course of more than 16 hours in education, you can, you can lose entitlement as well. So it, it, it's certainly some, something that the Scottish Government can look at. But the problem is in the year now, obviously, yeah. that the rollout universal credit is continuing 
before those changes uh, could be made. And, and I would imagine that if they go through the normal parliamentary process, it's, it's a year, 18 months before, before we'll, we'll be able to see anything like that happen. Indeed, so this is an argument for yeah. getting on with the job of delivering devolved carers allowance, not delaying it any further. It's also a, an argument for um, addressing the substance of the issue when it comes to designing carers allowance in Scotland under the powers that we, we now have. And you said you've made representations to the Scottish Government about this. What kind of response have you had to those represent, representations? On, on, it was particularly in relation to young carers, and we had a very positive response where they, they, they agreed to look at the, the regulations surrounding education in particular, but also perhaps employment. But, you know, we'll have to wait and see, obviously, what, what the eventual proposals that are, that are brought forward. I, certainly we agree, you know, there should be quick an adoption of the, the new benefits as possible, but there has to be a system in place that can deliver those benefits to the people that need them. And the problem would still be the interplay between the two. The Scottish Government could make it a rule that you can work more than 16 hours, which would free up some of that, but there will still be carers who probably are working under 16 hours, not because um, they don't want to earn more, but because that's all that they can physically or you know, mentally cope with on top of the caring responsibilities and they will still be subject to this requirement that they have to work, look for working more than 16 hours even if they're only working 10 hours a week. So that's, you know, that, that's still there as, as, as an issue. Well, thank you. It's clearly yeah. something that the committee is going to want to have a look at when it comes yeah. to examining regulations about carers allowance in the future. Thank you very much. Just before we move on, um, as uh, the MSP for Motherwell and Wish, I'm in the North Lanarkshire area, and you talked about um, lack of awareness and people not understanding what's happening, but um, North Lanarkshire have a, a, a kind of very good referral system in that anyone presenting to a third sector organisation like a food bank or, or to CAB or anywhere else will have a referral to, directly to a welfare rights officer to get people in front of the right people to get them access to a crisis grant or a welfare fund. Is that a model that you could see um, would be beneficial to be used as a, a best practice model. Yes, and what was mentioned earlier as well, which is you know, a full benefit check, but also referral to other agencies that can help because people in a crisis situation, it's not just the money. You know, for example, you know, I've got a, a leaflet here from COPE, uh, who you know, was, was a community group that I spoke to in Glasgow on, on Tuesday night, and I, you know, this is to do with stress. Uh, which, as you can imagine, <laughs> if you've no money to live on, uh, is, is going to happen. And it's, it's that sort of thing where you, you, you have an integrated approach where people are referred to all the services they need rather than just dealing with the immediate presenting issue, which, which will be, I've no money, how do, I, how, do I feed the, how do I feed the kids? You need to think through what are the other, other underlying issues that could be affecting this, which could be, for example, debt. Um, et cetera. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, Mr. Mr. Dickey? Yeah. No, just very much. We would um, uh, very much and, and actively are kind of promoting uh, the North Lanarkshire uh, approach um, for, for other local authorities to consider taking similar approaches. I think what's particularly effective about, about it is um, is that it's, it's looking at how we refer people um, to the Scotch Welfare Fund in the first place, so all those agencies that would otherwise, and in, in, in the past, and to else elsewhere in Scotland, their first port of call is to refer people to the food bank, um, that they've actually got the information in place uh, and the, the, the pathways in place to refer directly to the Scotch Welfare Fund, and then around the Scotch Welfare Fund, as well as um, a swift decision making being made around that person's eligibility and the provision of crisis grant, uh, then there is then that plug in to the wider income maximisation, money advice, housing, what are the other things that need to be put in place to ensure uh, a, a secure, sustained income and to, to reduce the, the financial pressures that are facing that, that family. And real evidence there that uh, um, those food banks participating in that referral network are seeing a real deep decline in the, uh, the number of uh, food bank parcels are having to, to, to make out and we're seeing an increase, on the other hand, an increase in the number of crisis grants that are being provided. So a far more uh, dignified, uh, sustainable approach to meeting the needs of people in crisis than just continuing to, to see food banks as the first port of call rather than the Scottish Welfare Fund. Ms. Ms. Oldham, you wanted to... Um, I think there, there's also possibility to expand that a little further and be thinking 
do GPs know, know of this? Do you know? Do our pharmacists know of this? Um, do the nursery nurses know of this? People who are the kind of less obvious within support organisations, but very much who will who will know of somebody being under a lot of stress, as Bill has highlighted, or you know, somebody um, is aware that the, a, a child's turning up to nursery not with with everything as, as kind of prepared as should be those the, the people out with as we would think that the kind of normal support organizations i think it would be useful if it could be extended um to those those bodies as well thank you yes miss Mina. just to add a point about um when you talk about best practice and um, another thing to consider would be the accessibility of the application process when uh, at the moment is either online or on the phone and if people um, have language barrier, interpreters are simply not provided. So, you know, simple things like this uh, needs to be looked at to ensure full accessibility when people know about it. Thank you. Thank you and thank you for raising the mental health issues and mental health awareness week, very poignant for us. So thank you. Um, I'm going to move on and bring in Ms McNeill. Thank you. Um, good morning. Um, so you'll know that the Scottish Welfare Fund is underpinned by legislative and statutory guidance with local authorities having some discretion. So this is, a, I think, a topic for, I think, a lot of examination. Um, so I, I'd like to ask what your view about the balance should be and should we remove some of the discretion? Um, thank you to Chair Paul for the Action Group for a very extensive um, paper on this. So I, I've noted that some of the points you've highlighted in relation to the discretion um, for local, local authorities is that you see some local authorities may be fettering the discretion to limit <coughs> applications. Um, well, that gives me cause for concern. You've um, suggested that there should be a look to see whether or not the national, a national delivery of the scheme might be more appropriate. Um, I would think I would be opposed to the national delivery. I think we should, I still think local authorities should have a level of discretion. But what I'm interested in is perhaps there should be a framework of rules that all local authorities should adopt. So one area that you highlight, for example, is that if you're waiting on a DWP benefit, you can't apply to the fund. That seems an obvious one to me. Uh, I would be uh, interested to hear the panel's views on what you think the balance between a statutory guidance and the discretion of local authorities should be if there was to be any consultation on it. It is a discretionary fund, so clearly there will be discretion applied, um, but there is statutory guidance, so the important thing is that decision making has regard to that statutory guidance and that as that statutory guidance evolves, there's consultation and uh, you know, it, 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 to ensure that it, it evolves in such a way that is um, contributing to the overall aims of the fund, which are to provide that the, the support that it aims to provide, rather than um, adding barriers or, or, or reducing uh, in, in, in response to increasing demand, trying to, 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 to contain that demand. Um, so there were, there, there were examples, as, as we've set out in, in, in the paper, where it uh, concerns that the information that's provided on local authority websites um, is, is, kind of, is at odds with the statutory guidance and is suggesting that there isn't eligibility where, in fact, there potentially would be um, if discretion was applied uh, in line with the, the statutory guidance. So the example you, you gave there of where a, a local authority um, suggests on its website that no grant is available if somebody's awaiting uh, a DWP claim decision, whereas in fact the statutory guidance is quite clear that uh, there's discretion to, to be able to give uh, a grant uh, in, in those circumstances. So clear situations where the information that's been provided uh, on, on websites is at odds with the um, actual the discretion that's available to local authorities to provide support. And I think that's kind of evolving in some ways. It is about containing within a, lim a limited pot of, of resources. So I think that comes back to this other issue of the adequacy of the fund. Are we actually providing a fund that's adequate to meet the need that's there um, rather than just evolving at local level in terms of local decision making and at national level in terms of 
the, the guidance evolving uh, evol in ways that are there containing demand rather than in ways that are ensuring that people who are potentially eligible yeah, are getting support. Yeah, I just want to ask support. you about this, John, because in a sense it doesn't matter if there was limit, if there's a limited, unlimited resource in the fund and the local authority said but you can't apply under these circumstances, i.e. if you're waiting on DWP benefit, it doesn't matter how big the fund is, if said you can't apply. So what would what would your what would the remedy be for for a situation like that? The remedy is to ensure that all the information that's provided uh, and the application process and the information on the web uh, it is in line with the statutory guidance uh, and isn't at odds with it. And there's too many examples where it's at, it appears to be at odds with the statutory guidance. And then actually, the decision-making processes too often seeming to be decisions being made um, in ways that are, again, at odds with the, the statutory guidance. And we had some concern that potentially that's a result of, um, again, limited resources in terms of administering decision-making, a rely over-reliance on the, the software that local authorities use, rather than having a direct regard to the statutory guidance uh, and ensuring that the, the discretion that's there is used to fulfil the overall objectives of the fund, which is to support those people who are facing crisis, facing exceptional pressures. In that case that you mentioned, I mean, has that been resolved or how would you resolve it? Well, I think we need to change the. <laughs> I think we need to. I suppose there's an, an issue here about where the overall oversight of the fund is. Who, who's taking responsibility for ensuring that local information that's provided and the, pro, the, the, the local processes for accessing the Scottish Welfare Fund are actually in line with the statutory guidance? Um, so that these things are picked up. And we're picking them up on a kind of ad hoc basis, um, which is why we've not, we've not sort of named particular local authorities. We've only picked them up here and there. We're not. There, there's a. I think there's a job to be done in terms of making sure that the overall picture is absolutely clear that local authorities are promoting uh, the fund and are not providing, not providing information and are not making decisions in any way that is at odds with the, the statutory guidance. So would it be your view that um, perhaps national delivery of the scheme might resolve questions like that? Yeah, I mean, I think we're sort of raising that, that potential. I mean, when the, the scheme was previously a DWP, um, when the, the DWP social fund was, was abolished, um, responsibility devolved to the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government, again, very welcome, put additional money in, set up a national scheme very much different from what's happened elsewhere in the UK. There was no national body or agency at that point that would make sense to administer uh, uh, this element of social security. Uh, there is now being developed a national social security agency. So given the, ex the extraordinary variation we're seeing uh, across local authorities, and there will be variation because the, there is discretion uh, in terms of decision making locally, but there's, the variation is quite extraordinary both in terms of the numbers of applications, the numbers of successful awards, the levels of those awards. Um, that in order to build up a more consistent approach, a more consistent approach to decision making, um, and I think to uh, perhaps support uh, accountability, um, and to support, uh, um, it might make it easier in terms of organisational learning and learning from the, the review decisions that are being made and the mistakes that are being picked up in terms of decision making if, there was, uh, if national delivery was considered. So I think it's more, more putting out there for consideration at this stage, but given the um, the, 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 you know, the, the variation uh, locally, um, I think it's something that does now need to be considered going forward. Just lastly, and is there any aspect um, of the scheme currently which is discretionary that you think shouldn't be left at the discretion, any particular aspect? So it's quite a big coming need to go away. I think there is, there's a problem with... Um, D discretion, <laughs> an important bit of social security being left to such discretion. I think the reality is we want to see more investment in uh, social security uh, in terms of uh, those, the adequacy and access to benefits to which people are entitled to so that they're not left in positions of such financial insecurity that our Scottish Welfare Fund is needed uh, to pick up the pieces. So actually investment in uh, entitlement, uh, social security that people are entitled to, uh, needs to be a priority. In the meantime, clearly, there's uh, situations where people are left in such unstable, you know, such insecurity and don't have uh, income to meet exceptional pressures uh, or situations where they're left with, with no money at all, um, that there's a, there's a need for a fund to deal with that. Um, 
we would need to give greater, con greater consideration to if there's elements of that would, would, that, that could potentially be um, not discretionary. But the, the entire basis of the fund is a, at the moment is it's a discretionary fund. Mr. Scott, you wanted to. Yeah. It's, it's just um, to point out that the Parliament passed unanimously a bill uh, less than a month ago that said that all claimants to the Scottish social security system should be treated with dignity and respect. That's primary legislation. That is binding, as far as I'm concerned, on the Scottish Welfare Fund, and yet it's not happening. We've cited instances where somebody was assumed to be a drug user when they asked for help and refused it on that basis, um, when in fact they were a disabled person. Uh, another person who was blind, who was told that, that don't, don't, we don't provide help for people like you, um, treated nothing short of disgracefully. Third person who said that you know, they were visited and told that because they got either DLA or PIP that they weren't entitled to help for a community care grant. Wrong. You know, not in guidance, not in regulations. Um, and that they had to buy it themselves. They were very rude and unhelpful. And we would dry, rather die than ask those. And I won't say it. <laughs> but, you know, they made it very clear that they were treated totally without dignity and respect. Now, when people have no money, the last thing they have is their dignity and their respect, their self-respect. And when somebody takes that away from them, they are damaged for it, by it, for a long, long time afterwards. And that is happening. And even if it's only isolated cases, it should be being addressed. And there should be a system of compensation for people that are not treated in line with dignity and respect because it allows local authorities to gatekeep in a fashion that is not in line with people's human rights. And, and I, I want to go back to the, uh, also the issue of accessing uh, the, the Scottish Welfare Fund. Some local authorities are still insisting that claims have to be made online. Learned disabled people, disabled people in general, one third of disabled people are not in line at all have no access to the internet and could not use it, even if they had access. So you're denying those people help by insisting that they claim online. I would argue under current law, even before the Social Security Bill was passed, that was illegal because it's discriminatory against disabled people. But once the Social Security Bill was passed, as soon as it's given royal assent, accessible communication standards apply. And accessible communication means that you have to deal with that person in the communication form that they require to be communicated in, not the, the, not the form that you impose on them. So, again, I, I have to see that the Scottish Government has responsibilities here. If it is going to say that advocacy will be regulated because we want to ensure that the standards that are uh, you know, given in advocacy provision have, you know, have training, etc., have to meet certain standards. How is it that Scottish Welfare Fund staff are not trained to not see disabled people you know, uh, as less than human um, and uh, treating people, anybody in poverty, without the dignity and respect that they're due? You know, the courtesy that they're due, politeness they're due, um, it's not right. And it has to be dealt with by Scottish Government because you are ultimately responsible for the laws. So, you know, I, I would say, you know, a national system, if that's not possible, at least regulate properly to make sure that local authorities are training their staff in disability equality and poverty awareness. Um, and that when instances of complaints are made about staff who are in the Scottish Welfare Fund, treating people less, with less than the, the respect that they're due, that they are due compensation, because that will remind local authorities what they have to do, because too many, I think, Scottish Welfare Fund um, workers are, are rightfully, in one sense, saying this is public money, we're not giving it out willy-nilly, but on the other hand, it's not their money. You know, that money was given to those local authorities to provide to the people who need it, and the huge variation suggests that some local authorities aren't getting that message, that uh, people in desperate need because something is going on when there is such a huge variation in uh, the 
number of uh, claims to the uh, authority and the number of awards. And, and that variation has to be dealt with as well. And I, you know, I would suggest that at least publishing the uh, Scottish uh, Public Service Ombudsman's findings so that there was some uniformity being arrived at in uh, the level of decision making would, would be a step towards that. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Holden. Um, so I think, I think we wouldn't be looking for, for the scheme to be moved to become national, um, but we would like there to be um, opportunities for more consistency. So to touch on the websites, for example, um, we had quite a, a look at those in response. Uh, in fact, we've looked at these um, every few months to see how they're... Um, how, how you can, can be approaching them. And some of the wording is, is <laughs> um, off-putting, to say the least. But, I mean, when you've got to be in a disaster and a crisis, and a, it, it sounds like you're needing to be part of a superhero film to, to actually apply for, for a community care grant or a crisis grant. Um, you don't always feel like you're, you're in that kind of bad a situation and you certainly for for such barriers to be put up kind of with wording to to put you off going for these these grants does not help um and and that seems to vary across the board so it feels like there's um a chance for some consistency there you know could we get it right once and then ask for for every local authority across the country to have to use the same wording and and that simply be be that um, I think there's also opportunity for us to, to just improve the, the whole ethos. You know, it, it is, it's a prevention fund, this, um, and that doesn't seem to be how it's viewed. You know, I mean, it, this is a way for, for the country to save so much money. Tenancy failure is, is anything around £25,000 per household. £600 for a accessing a community care grant, you know, if we really have people viewing this as the prevention fund, then I, I think that that would change things. But but there needs to be substantial training uh, across the local authorities on that, but with that level of consistency, not for it to be done time and time again in, in each and, and everyone's different kind of ways. So not for it for the scheme to become nationalised, but further to be uh, a bit more of a move to, to more consistency um, and that, that element of prevention to be very much high on the agenda, that this isn't just to help somebody in the absolute needs of crisis. No, this is to prevent kind of future things going wrong and this is for us to engage with somebody well and this is for us to, to demonstrate how good a country we can be and what we have on offer to, to really help that household. Ms. Minya. Uh, just to add to, to the responses, from the point of view of Scottish Refugee Council, the more we move away from discretion, the better, because refugees and reunited families who access the mostly crisis grant access it for the same reasons. So we've you know, as I said, there are expected crises at the moment. Most of those families and individuals are in Glasgow and we've got good relationship with Glasgow City Council and people do get a crisis grant. But if we could have, you know, more of a uh, insurance that, you know, those families will have access to crisis grant, um, you know, until we can change the systems further and we have a stronger partnership between housing, uh, Home Office, DWP, and that benefit, you know, mainstream benefits are, are processed quicker. We need to have a stronger guarantee that people will be able to access crisis grant. Asylum dispersal is likely to go beyond Glasgow. So we need to have other local authorities who've not had to deal with such a claim from newly granted refugees to provide the support in a similar way. Thank you. I've got a number of members wanting to come in on this issue, but I'll go to Ms. Johnson first. Thank you. Thank you very much for your evidence this morning. Um, I, I, it sounds like a very concerning picture. You know, if we know that food bank use has increased massively, um, but there's no such increase in, in applications for these grants, it sort of speaks to the fact that something isn't working. Um, I, I, you know, Mr. Scott, when you began this morning, you were saying it puts those in a position of deciding who does and doesn't um, qualify in a in a difficult position, to put it mildly, but it sounds as if, um, yeah, a lot of applicants are being put in a very difficult position too. Um, and I, I'm, I'm hearing sort of different views from the panel with regards to 
how national, you know, where the guidance should sit and just what sort of minimum standard there should be. Um, do you think, you've probably all given evidence during the, the progression of the Child Poverty Bill, and obviously local delivery plans are going to insist that local authorities have to let us know what they're doing. Um, do, you, do you think that this sort of information could be caught up in that? Yes, we, we declined this number of um, applications. We still make it impossible for people to apply in person. You know, do you think there's a, a space there for this to, you know, to be commented on at the very least? <laughs> I, I, th I think that there is evidence that gatekeeping is going on before people make claims. Uh, that's what really worries me, you know, that, that some of the uh, information that's coming forward is that people are being dissuaded from making claims because they're told that they're not the right sort of person to make a claim. And, and that shouldn't be happening. You know, it sh you know, everybody should be allowed to make the claim and then discretion applied. Discretion shouldn't be applied before the person makes a claim. And, and, but there, with any discretionary cash-limited fund, there is going to be pressure on staff to try and put people off who they think won't qualify. You know, and thinking they don't qualify and actually not qualifying are two different things. And, and you know, I, I, I do see evidence of gatekeeping. You know, for even within the statistics, it, it's quite evident that something is going on um, in terms of the level of claims. But there's also the, there are other problems, such as the repeat claims. So, you know, if somebody applies for a crisis grant more than three times, they're not going to get a fourth payment. Definitely not. You know, and and that the the evidence is that the number of people applying who've made previous applications for crisis grants is increasing, but the number of people being awarded crisis grants who've previously applied is decreasing. Right, and that means they've they've used up all their times. Where do they go then? That's why I'm saying the fund's under pressure. But that also means, because they've been told, after the fourth time, you're not going to get any more. We're not going to, they're not going to apply again because they know that they're not going to get any money. So, so the, there, there's a large number of people potentially out there who know that they can't apply. Mm -hmm. And so the unmet need is, is not being measured. Um, and and that's, a, that's, that's a problem as well. And by the way, as far as I, I could see, and from what, talking to local authority officials in the past, they apply the same rule to community care grants, more or less, even though it's not there technically in regulations that three strikes and you're out. But in practice, I think it probably is applied, um, which means you're unlikely to get. Which means, for example, a woman fleeing domestic violence who has to move house several times because you know, her ex-partner finds out where she lives or, or whatever, they could apply for maybe a third community care grant, having moved house a couple of times, and not get it. You know. And you know, these are worrying things that are, are there within the existing rules. And you know, they will always be there with a cash-limited system. But I think we do, ha we do have to try and measure the un unmet need to find out you know, what is the true level that, you know, that we should be supplying help at, rather than the level that, that's been supplied at. Ms. Oldham, you wanted to? Yeah, well, just to follow on from that, I think I think we're at the point where we we should be looking to see who who is being turned down and really kind of looking at the nitty gritty of these applications, but also asking for um, a record where somebody has approached a local authority and not got as far as as even making the application for that to be recorded, um, and for for reasons why um, no applications even been kind of. Um, put forward in any way and for us to then be able to look at that and, and the outcomes of that and it, and it might be that actually there's been misunderstanding but it might be that actually yeah there, there's just a, an element that needs to be re-looked at for, for how the, the grant moves forward. Ms Maguire you wanted to come in? So, I'll let you in. Getting to the point where we're getting pushed for time, but I'll let Ms. McGuire and, and Mr. Adam with their supplementaries, and then maybe we'll come back to you, Mr. Convener, Scott. Mr. Scott and Ms. Oldham picked up on the points I was going to ask, so oh, I'll save okay. you some time there. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Adam, you just have to I'll just be very quick this time, even though I said that last time and I was a wee bit longer than I expected. Uh, but uh, I was interested, I hadn't thought about it, John, until you mentioned it there. 
uh, about national delivery of uh, the Scottish Welfare Fund. And uh, really, I, I know there's different opinions in the panel, but I was quite struck with it. I just want to ask, are you suggesting that that is a good way forward? And if so, can you expand on the benefits you see in doing it that way? I think certainly something that should be considered, given the extraordinary variation uh, that we are seeing um, with local delivery. Um, we ended up with local delivery, I think, because at the point at which the, uh, uh, the devolution of um, the welfare fund or de devolution of the social fund took place, there was no obvious national agency. We now are moving towards having a, a national social security agency. So I think it's something that really needs to be thought about. Does this not fit better within that national social security agency, particularly given that agency will have uh, a local presence, presence supporting people to access um, devolved benefits? Um, in terms of the, the benefits, I think it is about ensuring uh, consistency of decision making, consistency of uh, ensuring that people are having, the decision makers are having regard to the, to the statutory guidance. Um, I think that's at the moment is a bit unclear what, what the, the accountability is. There's, 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 there are lots of examples of people that have picked up here where both the information provided publicly online is at odds with this, the, the statutory guidance and decision making itself. Uh, too often not in line with what the, the statutory guidance would suggest. So having uh, an expertise of decision making uh, developing within an organisation, uh, uh, being able to review it, being able to take account of reviews of decisions, uh, build that into future decision making, I think there's some real advantages to that. Also in terms of, we've got some examples of people falling between uh, local authorities in terms of which local authority they should be um, getting support from, so are being told by uh, local authorities, that by both local authorities that are potentially the, the local authority responsible, uh, that they should go to the other one and find themselves with no local authority, to, 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 with no Scottish Welfare Fund um, support. So I think it's something that really should be considered quite seriously. Um, I think in the meantime, um, in, the abs you know, in the meantime, we also need to be looking at why, why is there such uh, variation uh, across the country at the moment. Um, you know, is it to do, I think to some extent it might be to do, to do with an accurate recording of decision or variations in how decisions and, and processes are being recorded? Um, is it to do with uh, local gatekeeping? And again, we would echo what others ha have said, that there is very real evidence of um, demand being contained through gatekeeping, not least um, in relation to the channel, the number of channels you're able to access the Scottish Welfare Fund, the guidance very clear that it should be at least three channels uh, online, face-to-face, -face, telephone. In practice, people being told they have to uh, apply online, except in very exceptional circumstances. Um, uh, so, I, I, yeah, I mean, this was in, in summary, um, something that should be seriously considered as a way of trying to ensure um, uh, improve the quality of decision making and um, ensure greater consistency that wherever you live clearly there will be there's discretion will be applied but that discretion has been applied in a consistent way across the the, the country in the sense in that i know the local authorities believe that the amount that they're being provided to administer the fund is inadequate and there is a question as to whether that money five million pounds or so might be better utilised at a national level where economies of scale are much easier to achieve. Um, so I agree with John, you know, I think it's an accident in history in some ways that we've ended up with the Scottish Welfare Fund being administered by local authorities because, of course, the, pre the, the social fund was administered by the DWP, a national agency, and it, it could see all the review decisions and take them into account Whereas each local authority is only getting back the review decisions that are given to it and therefore isn't able really to learn from other local authorities who may have already made the same mistake, let's say, and, and how they've applied uh, the guidance or regulations. So, you know, I think, I think there is certainly, there's a case to be made for it uh, to go to a national level. Um, and I think it should be investigated whether that might be a more efficient way of delivering what will, for the foreseeable future, remain cash-limited fund. Okay. I'm going to bring in Mr Griffin. Um, there. Thank you, Kumira. I think just to touch on the earlier, the, the powerful points that Bill Scott made around how the applicants uh, are treated, I think I would fully agree with that. That's why I moved amendments. It, 
to the bill that would have brought the welfare fund under the Scottish Social Security System rules, which unfortunately weren't accepted, but there still is uh, the existing rules there that applicants should be treated uh, with respect and that their, their dignity should be preserved. Those are the existing rules. And if you've got examples that you can give to committee that we can highlight with the, the minister, I think that would, that would be helpful. Maybe isolated examples, because it was only a straw poll. It's certainly not the main thing that we, we find when we do consultations around social security. M most of the concern uh, are around you know, work capability assessments, PIP assessments, universal credit, sanctions. But you know, for each individual that's affected, it is, it's, it's an enormous thing, and, and it shouldn't be happening, um, because it doesn't cost anything to be polite. Uh, to somebody in Kirchus, um, and um, that's why it should happen, because it, it is a human right, where, whether, whether it's on in the face of the Scottish welfare reform legislation or not, uh, it remains an, uh, you know, an aspect of the Human Rights Act, and, and that still applies. So it shouldn't be happening, but it is happening. Thanks for that. The sub substantive questions I wanted to ask were around the, the budget for the Scottish Welfare Fund. Uh, the budget has been um, frozen since April 2013, um, which represents a real terms cut of £3 million. Um, I just wonder what members of the panel thought about um, a real terms cut to the value of the Scottish Welfare Fund at, at a time where it's already been pointed out the universal credit full service rollout is having a, a real impact and whether um, you feel the, the the budget that's set aside for the welfare fund is, is adequate to meet the, the needs now and as we go forward with full service rollout. Right away with universal credit, the, the sanctions figures suggest that only one third of the people affected by conditionality are currently on the universal credit claimant count but 71% of all the sanctions that are being imposed are on universal credit claimants, which my quick arithmetic suggests you're about two and a half times as likely to be sanctioned on universal credit as you are on JSA or uh, ESA. That, that means a lot of people are, are going to lose 40% of the benefit for two and a half times as long as the benefits JSA or ESA would, they would lose it for because hardship payments under universal credit are loans, they're recoverable and they're recovered from the benefit as soon as the person's sanctions finished. So they lose 40% of the benefit, not for a month, but for two and a half months, not for six months, but for you know, 15 months, etc. cetera. Not, not for three years, but for <laughs> seven, eight, seven, approaching eight years. You know, the, it's, it's, it's going to create huge pressure on the fund um, as, as universal credit is, is ruled out if that length level of sanctions continues. Yeah, Ms. Munia. If, if new refugees were to apply for universal credit a week after they are granted status, which is the soonest they can do because they need a biometric resident permit to do that, with the processing time of universal credit, they will need at least a crisis grant to, to sustain three weeks. So we know that most new refugees we need a crisis grant for at least three weeks. And I say at least because most refugees will actually apply the second or third week of their move-on period, just the time to get around to everything they need to do during that move-on period. So that will have a serious increase of, uh, of payment, uh, mostly in Glasgow. Okay. Mr Dickey, yeah. yeah no question, we need to be increasing investment in the Scottish Welfare Fund as long as we're seeing people facing income crisis, ending up having to use food banks when they could be eligible for uh, support through the Scottish Welfare Fund, we need to be making sure the fund is adequately resourced to meet their needs, so that people aren't unnecessarily ending up uh, reliant on charitable food aid. Um, so no question we need to increase resourcing for the Scottish Welfare Fund. Um, at the moment, I think as we've already discussed, how demand is being contained um, rather than necessarily met, uh, needs met. Um, and one way of avoiding, given it's a cash-limited discretionary 
fund uh, at, at the moment, um, avoiding a continued push towards reducing the numbers of people who are, uh, who, 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 or, or kind of containing that demand. We need to be investing in it to ensure that we're able to meet people's needs. Yeah, repeating myself, but it is a preventative spend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very much. Around the family reunion crisis grant, whether you feel the the hundred thousand pound budget is adequate to cover uh, the demand which may be put on that particular fund. Um, it's it's a it's a good step forward. It's very good to have this fund available. Is the acknowledgement that the need is there, and there's you know it's great to see to see um, such fund put put aside for reunited families. Um, it's difficult to say in the sense that um, family, you, you don't know in advance how many how big the families will be when you know in the in the next year there could be people bringing just spouse or one children but there could be up to six or seven children in some instances so it's difficult to give an estimate on that but this fa those families will also be hit by the universal credit most reunited families are in will be in Glasgow so from September 2018 you know it's going to be very large families potentially having you know needing a crisis grant for six weeks, you know, for the whole period of universal credit being being processed. Because when they arrive, they've got no income at all, uh, and they only rely on a single allowance of the sponsor who've, uh, who brought them here. So, is the, I, I've not done the math before before coming, uh, but it'll be important to monitor and uh, when this fund will be, will be used. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring Mr. McPherson. Hi again, panel. Uh, Jules Oldham, I just wanted to ask some questions around your submission around the, the, the topic of, of homelessness. You, you state in your written evidence that you see it as an invaluable fund, the one that demonstrates that small amounts of money can be used to help make a big difference. Uh, perhaps you could elaborate on the difference from uh, your experience that the fund has made in terms of uh, preventing and mitigating homelessness. Certainly. I mean, in relation to homelessness, the, the main element is the community care grants. So when somebody is moving on from temporary or supported accommodation, often with, with only literally a black bag, not even full of, of goods within that, to move into a new tenancy, um, they could be moving in without a community care grant to simply the, the bare walls and, and nothing more. Um, the community care grant um, enables them to have white goods, it enables them to have a bed to sleep on, um, a sofa. I mean, it is very much the, the absolute basics. And I have put in my response that I think we could do a wee bit better on that because it's taking things to that ever so slightly um, better level really would make the difference in particular. If you've got poor mental health, then actually having the ability not to have a kind of big bright light on in the middle of your room, but to have some lower level lighting, something like that can, can really make a difference. So yeah, I mean, the difference from a community care grant to not is really the difference between a, a tenancy succeeding or, or failing. Um, we've also put into our response though that the timing around this is also crucial. And I think there's, there's um, possibility for us to improve upon that. Um, don't get me wrong, the, the timings have improved since it's come to Scotland by, by a, a long way, but there's, um, there is possibility to, as it stands just now, I should explain that um, we still have people moving into tenancies without the goods actually that they need without a bed to sleep on um, in some cases as as soon as they move in simply because not everything's processed quickly enough. Um, were we to change to allow somebody not to have an address where they actually um, went for a community care grant, so for example somebody moved into t supported or temporary accommodation, at that point if they could apply for a community care grant be, be informed that yes, we, we will be able to give you that unless you win the lottery or something. Meantime, you know, you will be, um, or any other change in circumstances, you'll be allocated with, with 
whatever fund of money, and then on receipt of knowing which address that person's moving to, they sign to say something, yes, I've not changed, my circumstances haven't changed, and the funds are released immediately, that can make a huge difference, because the fund really has the difference in making sure there's, there is a sustained tenancy or not. I mean, it is a case of having absolutely nothing just the clothes that you're, you're standing in, possibly another set of clothes to having the, the start for, for a home. Um, I, I, though we do have the possibility, I, th I think, for actually taking that that bit further, as I, I mentioned, I think, because we're, we're very much looking at just the bare bones um, and those little bits of, of difference can, can really change from being a house that's furnished to a home. So. Upon that and, and, and building on the, the benefits that those grants supply and, and, and trying to enhance that delivery. Do you have empathy with what's been said already by some of the other panellists around if there were economies of scale and this was delivered through national, the, the Social Security Agency, that there, there could be benefits in that? And uh, are there issues with differentiation between local authorities that you've come across? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think most local authorities have gone for sort of quite good packages, and I think I think there's a lot of similarities that are actually across the country. When I said that we we're, we wouldn't be asking for things to be moved nationally, it's not that we would be against that. It's just that that's not been one of the things that our members have actually put forward as as one of their requests. But when it comes to procurement and actually being able to to offer things on on a broader scale, then yes, I mean that, that's certainly something that that could be could be looked at. It's not that we're we're against things moving to, to something becoming national. It's that we're a, a membership organisation for homelessness, um, and and it's not something that's that's arisen. It's it's been more that has come back to us that actually there's there's been some positives in having the the kind of locality taken into account. So maybe. Um, a relationship with with one some local suppliers and that sort of thing. So, um, I guess we don't want to lose that element of it if, we're, if it was to go national. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, Mr. Tomkins. Did you want to? Go? Oh, it's really? been covered. Thank you very much. Um, could I just um, finally ask? Um, there's been a lot of discussion about um, different services from different areas and about training for local government members and things. I, are any of you aware of any substantive work that COSLA has done in looking at the operation and the, the, the requirements of, of actually delivering the welfare fund in local authorities? Mr Scott, yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, I'm aware that COSLA has been involved, um, but our involvement, I think, at a national level probably ended about two years ago, but COSLA were, were definitely involved at that time in uh, trying to set up training, um, which would alert... Uh, local authority officials administering the fund to the needs of disabled people. And we think that was quite successful, but it's not continued. <laughs> so, you know, turnover uh, and the fact that only a, a very small number of local authority staff were even trained at that time um, would suggest to us that, you know, that that, that sort of training is, isn't being provided, uh, even, even if COSLA and the Scottish Government thought it was worthwhile. Um, it, it's, it's not something we've been asked to do. Uh, so I, I know that, that there's no local authorities, as far as I'm, I, I'm aware, who, who've asked us to do that. Okay. Well, that, there was, initially, there was training and support to, to local authorities and a national uh, network of local authority leads uh, in relation to Amazon. We've, we've lost, a bit like, we've sort of lost touch with what's happening there. I suppose all the, the focus on the social security bill and uh, has, has, has taken up a lot of attention, I think, probably at our end and also within, within government. But I think this, this, the, um, the committee's inquiry is actually a really good opportunity to, to revisit this and actually think, is, is, the, is there adequate training support at national level to uh, local authority leads and decision makers around the Scottish Welfare Fund uh, and maybe revisiting some of the training that did happen uh, initially where there was sort of awareness training around poverty and the experience um, of you know, what kind of experiences people would be coming to local decision make makers uh, behind them uh, as well as training in fact we provided some training as well in terms of the, the detail of the, the, the regulations and the guidance so I think yeah time to, to revisit that and see if is what in place is in place now uh, still uh, adequate to, to, to provide uh, support. One last point. It's also what we don't know about the fund as much as what we do know about the fund that's a worry. 
um, because in the initial days, the first couple, two or three years, figures were collected at a local authority level, and I think they were inaccurate, but they gave us some indication people with vulnerabilities who applied to the fund, and that included disabled people. So, you know, people were identified as learning disabled, mental health issues, physical impairment, sensory impairment, etc. That's not done now. And, you know, one of our concerns, which we've identified, is if you look at the graphs in terms of um, likely to be taken into care if a, a community care grant isn't awarded, that's going down like that, and coming up to meet it is families under exceptional pressure. There could be a, a perfectly reasonable explanation for that, is, is that it's per perhaps easier to, to fit the entitlement criteria for families under exceptional pressure than it is to get for being a disabled person likely being taken into care. But we don't know. <laughs> and, and it is worrying when you see those figures because we've no idea if the number of da disabled people in their families who are being awarded community care grants is falling or not because it's not collected. And, and you know, the worry is that the numbers are falling because there's pressure on the fund, but we don't know. Yeah. Okay, um, can I thank you all for your attendance at committee this morning. It's been a really useful session and um, I'm going to suspend for five minutes to let the panels change over.
Thank you. Um, can I welcome to committee this morning our second panel, um, Morag Johnson, Director of Financial and Business Services from Glasgow City Council, Craig Mason, Senior Manager, Council Advice Services, Dundee City Council, and Sheila McCandy, Benefits and Welfare Manager from Highland Council, and a warm welcome to you this morning. Um, I'd just like to, to open the same question I had for the first panel, is, is what do you see as being the, the pressures on the, the Welfare Fund going forward? Um, Ms Johnson, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, convener. Um, so I would echo the comments that were made by the previous panel in terms of the pressures um, that are coming down the line, particularly with um, universal credit. Um, you know, certainly for Glasgow, we are not yet at the stage of full service rollout. That is something that will be happening from this September. And that is something that we see as um, potentially significantly increasing pressure, particularly on our crisis grants. Um, in the submission, had highlighted that our crisis grants applications have significantly increased since the, the start of the fund, particularly over the last few years. Um, and I suppose our concern is that um, certainly the rollout of universal credit could significantly impact on that, which is, is one of the reasons that influenced the decision of the Council to um, maintain its level of funding at, at the 17-18 um, level. Um, and I think it's just um, th that demand that is on local authorities to try and manage the budget that is allocated versus the demand the demand that, that is there. So certainly um, universal credit is one of the, the challenges that we see. Okay, Mr Mason. Um, <clears throat> we're actually in Dundee, we're actually in uh, full service now. Um, and I think early signs are quite good, but that may well be because we've actually done a huge amount of preparation um, for universal credit and um, working with our DWP colleagues and also um, voluntary and statutory sector um, services as well. Um, I think my, my thinking is that um, longer term, um, there is a, a danger with the reduction in benefit levels generally. I think we're starting to see the slow burn of the change from RPI to CPI um, that happened a few years ago with um, welfare reform. And I think that is something that's probably been missed this morning in some of the evidence. I think low income levels are primarily the reason that people come back to um, Scottish Welfare Fund for crisis grants, perhaps. Um, in terms of the universal credit full service, though, um, we have seen perhaps an indication that people are taking up advanced payments um, when they're signing on for universal credit um, and that that has perhaps led to a kind of levelling off of our crisis grants as well as the other work that we do in Dundee to try and help people at point of contact um, whenever they come up close to a crisis. Thank you. Ms McCandy. So universal credit was first launched in Scotland in Highland and that was back in July 13. We were then moved to full service in June 16, so we have experienced universal credit for a long time. And at the same time, Scottish Welfare Fund came on stream in April 13. Um, as at today, about 50% of our caseload for crisis grants and community care grants are universal credit cases. Now, what we don't have any evidence of would these universal credit claimants applied anyway under the legacy benefit system? So we're not really seeing that paying of pain through universal credit that others have described. Um, but as um, Craig has alluded to there, all the work that has gone on in, prep in preparing for universal credit um, and ensuring that claimants are signposted and helped through the correct uh, channels for help. There was a lot of talk this morning about the benefit cap and a Scottish Welfare Fund. Well, the benefit cap is eased through discretionary housing payments, not through the Scottish Welfare Fund. Certainly, that's the approach in Highland. Um, so, when um, an individual approaches the council, that's what we do. We look to see, well, what is the correct avenue for that council? Moving forward in terms of the pressures to answer your question directly, as welfare reform kicks in more dramatically, um, and as local government funding cuts continue, I think there's going to be a point where there's, we're going to come to a point where, well, what do we do? There, there's real pressures coming down the line, um, and it's in, really important that we all work together to anticipate what those pressures are and to do whatever we can at local level to help our residents. Thank you. Ms. Maguire, you wanted to? Good morning, panel. Um, 
we heard a bit about some of the, the poor experience um, people had had when applying, and I'm, I'm sure you know, we'd acknowledge that that can happen in any organisation. I wonder if you'd like to say a bit about the benefits of um, local delivery of this type of assistance and give an indication of whether, um, as, as was mentioned, you've managed to, to build up any relationships with um, suppliers, for example, that have made getting help to people um, quicker. Ms Johnson, yeah. Okay. Um, I suppose the, the first thing I would comment on is obviously hearing those comments about poor experience, and I would certainly say that is not something that we would want to support. Um, obviously, everybody that approaches the Scottish Welfare Fund should be treated with dignity and respect. Um, in terms of training, there is you know, regular training with staff in, in terms of how they engage with people. Certainly in Glasgow, one of the things we've looked at over the last couple of years is that poverty awareness training, not developed just for the council, but actually more broadly with a number of partners um, to ensure that um, when staff are dealing with, with claimants, they, they don't have any preconceived ideas and try and, and, try and, and deal, deal with them. Obviously, unfortunately, sometimes that does emerge and, and we will try and, um, and deal with that th through training. Um, in terms of the benefits of um, local delivery, um, I, th I think where that does come into play is because of the, uh, the knowledge and, and local awareness and the particular issues that happen um, in different local authorities, you're, you're better able to respond to them. Obviously, there was some discussion previously about refugees, and that has been a particular issue um, that has affected Glasgow most closely uh, or, or, or most acutely. And I think you know, that local um, knowledge has allowed the relationship to be built up with the Scottish Refugee Council and to try and deal with that. Um, and you'd specifically mentioned there in terms of benefits benefits of local delivery. When um, the Scottish Welfare Fund was introduced um, in 2013, uh, Glasgow decided to use um, its uh, relationship with City Building and Royal Strathclyde Blaincraft Initiative, RSBI, um, which is a supported um, employment initiative in Glasgow um, as, as one of the ways that we could um, deliver on our community care grants. Um, and what that has allowed us to do is to build a very close relationship with that organisation, which obviously has broader community benefits as well because it supports um, uh, disabled uh, people in employment um, and make sure that we can um, deliver goods within um, the timeframes that are, that are set out. Um, and obviously we have a close relationship with them and we can discuss with them, particularly where there have been budget pressures, about how we can work together to try and manage, um, if you like, the, the cost of the goods and the type of goods uh, that, are, that are being delivered. So that has proven to be um, very beneficial. A couple of the other areas for Glasgow um, we have the Improving Cancer Journey project, which has now been, has, which is rolled out across a number of local areas. And again, that's one of the areas that the Scottish Welfare Fund staff have worked for, uh, very closely with in terms of ensuring that if there is a need for um, financial support, that the Scottish Welfare Fund uh, is linked very closely with the, the, the workers there. So they're just a couple of examples of where I think that local delivery has, has brought benefit. Mr Mason. Yeah. Um, in Dundee, uh, we initially started the Scottish Welfare Fund as a joint effort between our rev revenues and benefits service and our welfare rights service. And there was a lot of talk at the beginning. Um, I managed the welfare rights service at the time. And there was a lot of talk about whether those two um, types of decision maker and those type, two types of disciplines work together well. Our welfare rights team saw it as a great opportunity to try and help people at point of crisis. Um, so, as a result of that, we worked alongside Revenues and Benefits and um, a couple of years ago, the service came fully into um, the Council Advice Services. There was a restructuring. Um, so, essentially, we have a link within our service directly to welfare rights officers, um, to money advisors, um, to energy efficiency um, advisors as well, um, and also employability services. Um, we all sit in the same area. Um, the decision maker's um, role is um, there are Chinese walls almost between it. Um, no pressure can be put on those decision makers. But essentially, we've got um, a full complement of different types of advisors who are well aware of their colleagues in the Scottish Welfare Fund. They're well aware of what the grants can provide for, what kind of help is offered, while at the same time offering the help in their own individual disciplines or collectively, um, depending on the, the client's individual needs. Um, 
In terms of training, um, we provide all our staff with poverty awareness training, which is run by um, Dundee Healthy Living Initiative and the Welfare Rights Team um, working together. Um, so I think, you know, really in terms of that, um, it's a gateway in from our point, point of view to the Scottish Welfare Fund and all those individual services work to try and identify clients that they're working with who would benefit from a grant and make a direct referral. Um, the external services we've got collectively a, a, a piece of work at the moment, um, really trialling over the next two, two to three years um, a collective um, uh, project with six other voluntary sector organisations where we're working to collective targets in relation to budgeting and debt advice for clients looking for long-term support. And I think, you know, through, those, um, through that increased partnership working, we're getting um, more um, joint working in our traditional areas um, between those services. Um, I think in terms of um, local delivery, Dundee's pretty good. Um, I would suggest that, at, um, as I've said, voluntary sector and statutory sector working together um, to the same aims. Um, and I think we've um, tried, where possible, to bring in external agencies, invite them in on a Wednesday morning, meet the decision makers, get a sense of what the Scottish Welfare Fund is about, um, and actually just you know, go through dummy cases with them, um, anonymised obviously, um, to see how they would, you know, how the decision maker would tackle that individual case and how they would make a decision for better understanding within those agencies. So we like to see it as a type of spider's web. You know, we've got the, the sort of main um, services within the council working together with the Scottish Welfare Fund in mind, but we also try and bring in external services. Um, in terms of um, suppliers, um, we work with, um, we started initially working with a couple of social enterprises. So we work, worked with Dovetail um, Enterprises and Clean Close. We're still, um, we still have that um, relationship with Dovetail and they still supply most of our um, goods um, in relation to beds, bedding, um, sofas, etc. Um, Clean Close was another um, social enterprise that we worked with. And I think in terms of the delivery and perhaps the fitting of carpets by the, the Clean Close company, we've developed that local relationship whereby they're actually aware of the client's needs when they're going into a household to lay carpeting or linoleum or whatever. Um, so we get a, a, a better service, we think, through having that relationship and actually putting... Um, <coughs> an element of um, uh, sort of feedback from them where we have a, a vulnerable client um, and how perhaps that vulnerable client might need um, special help to get you know, the carpets laid or whatever, whether it be because of a disability or something else. Um, and I think those link up opportunities in Dundee, um, it's been hard work over the years, but I think we're, we're now at the stage where um, we are working together and we're starting to work very closely with our housing department to look at those transitions into new tenancies and where we fit in. We've done it on an ad hoc basis, but we're trying to make it more efficient at present um, to see whether we can actually um, capitalise on the fact that their housing offices are now tenancy officers and have got more of a um, responsibility for making sure that the tenancy is sustainable um, we're trying to work with them um, and offer the Scottish Welfare Fund um, community care grants at the right point of time. Okay. Thank you, Ms. McCandy. Certainly in Highland, we've got the challenge of geography. You know, we're 20% 20, 20 larger than the size of Wales. Um, so it's really important for us that services are local. Um, and how we achieve that is we have um, teams based in each of our localities um, who work together. We have very close links within the council. So the council services work very closely together to, uh, to help deliver Scottish Welfare Fund. We've also got excellent links, links with the third sector. Indeed, we've a number of contracts with the third sector, sector for delivery of various um, services for us including advice and information services. We invest 1.1 million in our local CAB to deliver that for us. Um, in terms of local delivery of services for Scottish Welfare Fund, we've got two local suppliers. One's New Start Highland, um, which is a local charity, um, employ, um, lots of, provide lots of employment for people 
they provide second-hand goods for us and good quality second-hand goods. We've also got the furnishing service who, ha who are Glasgow-based but have set up a depot um, locally with us and are creating employment opportunities. Um, we've also got um, a very close eye on the localism agenda and how we deliver that and we comply with the needs in the localism agenda. So we think local delivery is really important in Highland um, for all of these reasons, but most importantly for the individual who's receiving our services and who needs to access our services. When somebody comes into the council, um, quite often they're directed to the welfare team who will look at all of the entitlements and needs of that individual and then do warm referrals. Um, and what we mean by warm referrals is the officer of the council will make their way to the service to ensure that the citizen receives that service rather than just signposting the citizen to wherever they need to go, because quite often they don't get there. Um, so we think that's really important that local delivery is retained. Thank you. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. Also um, ask about what information you gather in terms of, I don't know whether it would be in terms of um, performance. We heard there that there was, there was some concern that we might not have a picture of who was being um, accepted and who was being refused and, and how... Um, that information could be kind of drilled into to see how how uptake was and, and, and whether there were any issues. Can you tell me a little bit about how your local authority um, collects information on who's coming to you and what's going to happen? Um, we, when the local authorities met initially when the Scottish Welfare Fund was to transfer to them, um, there was talk of perhaps a single IT system um, for the Scottish Welfare Fund across all 32 local authorities, um, we gather that that, you know, because of the timescales, that was that couldn't happen at, the, at that point in time. Um, so therefore, we we now have a situation where there are maybe three or four different main suppliers of um, IT systems to the Scottish Welfare Fund. So Dundee has. Um, a system called Northgate, um, which we share with, I think, another four local authorities. Um, so all the information potentially is in um, the systems themselves. It's really, I think, the reporting back. Um, we're requested, we're, we're, we get requests on a quarterly basis, for, or on a monthly basis, sorry, for our, our information that's um, published quarterly. Um, so the information potentially is there, and I think, you know, it's it's... At a local level, we try and understand the data um, in terms of who's applying, who's um, perhaps missing out on applications. Um, but uh, within the team itself, um, those, discussion, those discussions are ongoing. So we have, um, we have staff training groups within Dundee where we sit down and we look at decisions. And I think in my submission, I had, I'd said that the SPSO publish um, some sort of um, pieces of information about individual decisions. So we discuss those with our, um, our Scottish Welfare Fund decision makers to get better decision making across the piece. Um, so the information that's gathered will be the number of um, applications that have been made and obviously that's monitored against the number of awards that are made. So that, that is regularly monitored. I think in terms of the issue that was, that was raised in the previous evidence session, I think what was being suggested is that there are people who don't even get to the stage of making an application because um, it's viewed that they will be they are put off for various means. Um, that's not information that we, we necessarily would uh, be able to gather. I, I was thinking about how we could try and gather that type of information. Probably the only way would be to try and, and in some way, if we you know monitor our telephone inquiries and see whether you know through that um, there's a way to do that. But it's only when an application is received it would actually be, um, if you like, you know registered at, at, at that point. With that um, information that that you are gathering, can you drill into? Um, any vulnerabilities that, that people might have that are that are coming to you? I think this, this specific ask was about um, people with disability or? Um, yes, I mean, obviously I picked up the point in the earlier session about the fact that it looks as if there were some detailed information gathered at the beginning of the scheme that is no longer gathered. Um, I think, as, as, as Craig has referred to, the, the systems that are used themselves kind of mirror the data collection that is requested by the Scottish Government. Um, I, I'm not aware about why those particular 
areas were, were removed from the data gathering. Um, that, you know, that's something that we would need to take back and try and understand whether it just did become too difficult, whether the information wasn't um, easily identifiable through the conversations with claimants. I, I'm speculating at this point, but um, so at, at this point in time, if it's, if it's not requested by the Scottish Government, then it's not something that we would necessarily um, be recording in Glasgow. Thank you. Do you want to come in? No. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to move to Ms McNeil. Uh, thank you very much. Um, good morning. Um, so we can see from your evidence so far that the importance of local delivery and for each you know, local authority, that's going to be different and it's to see, uh, pretty impressive to listen to. But the previous panel, we had an exchange about the, the level of discretion versus the national rules. So you will have heard, for example, that um, the evidence that there is extreme variation across the country, um, that some local authorities have been accused of gatekeeping. Um, uh, in one instance, the local authority had misinformed applicants about the, 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 the grounds on which they could apply. Um, so I'm interested in your views um, about whether or not we sh there should be less discretion. I guess you're going to say no to that, but I think if, if that's your view, it would be just interesting to hear and give any suggestions to how we can make decision making look a bit more um, consistent. And it would also be helpful for me certainly to know that, so in each local authority, presume you have your own internal guidelines about who qualifies and who doesn't, and that'll be for every local authority to decide, and that might be one of the reasons why there's quite wide variation across the country. Indeed, we, we go back to source, so we always go back to the, um, the national guidance um, in every single case. Uh, but as I say, if SPSO have, have put in information on their website about particular cases, then we'll discuss those. Um, I, I, I don't recognise in our authority any sort of um, gatekeeping issues. Um, and in fact, you know, that was one of my bugbears about the previous system was that at one point you, you couldn't actually get an application for a crisis loan. Um, you couldn't actually get the physical form for a, 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 a crisis loan back then. Um, you couldn't, you had to go through um, a, a gatekeeper, essentially, who would make those sorts of judgments. So I sort of see it as being, you know, everyone has the right to make an application and um, ultimately it's the decision maker um, who makes that decision and if the person feels that it's it's the wrong decision then they can ask for a separate um, decision maker to look at that under the first tier review on that point yeah. so the decision maker will make, obviously make, make the decision about whether someone needs a crisis loan or, or whatever um, so they will have there will be some guidance that that decision maker will use the criteria and that would be particular to Dundee for example um, that no, guidance would it no? we, we would go we would look at the individual yeah. um, circumstances of the case and see whether they fit under the criteria the national for, guidance yes right the national so that's guidance. where you would go no, that's yeah absolutely know. yeah um, anyone else um, again, certainly uh, in Glasgow, it is the national guidance that, that is used um, to uh, determine any um, criteria and any award. And I think the decision maker just has to look at each case on its own merits. Um, I think you know it was interesting. Uh, there's obviously been the reference, particularly for crisis grants, for there's only three awards. But I think there's also evidence that in a number of cases, people do get more than three awards. And I think that just identifies that the decision makers have to look at each case on its own merits in terms of whether they, they are actually um, in, in crisis or not. So again, um, it's very much going back to the national guidance and that's what the decision makers are encouraged to use. Um, obviously the issue of consistency is an important one and that's something that will be uh, discussed both through uh, feedback from SPSO decisions, which again, um, you know, Glasgow does get a significant number of referrals to the SPSO, um, and those decisions uh, that are upheld are all reviewed, and information from them investigated to see whether there is a particular issue, is there a systemic issue, one of uh, a misunderstanding of the guidance or of training. Um, and in some cases, we will go back and speak to the SPSO to try and get a bit more information. If, if we feel there is a difference of opinion of the interpretation um, of that guidance. 
Um, probably the other thing maybe just to mention at this stage is obviously the issue of uh, uh, gatekeeping um, and absolutely everyone who um, uh, everyone should be able to make an application. Um, I think one of the challenges that we have with the Scottish Welfare Fund is this issue of um, budgetary constraint. And actually, um, you know, certainly in the evidence from Glasgow, I had made the point that Glasgow had been engaging with, um, you know, third sector agencies to make them aware of the fact that Glasgow has effectively been at high priority for a, for a number of years now because of budgetary constraint. Now, that's not to say that people shouldn't apply, but I think that was trying to set an expectation. And I think this is one of the challenges that we have with the Scottish Welfare Fund because of budgetary constraint. It's about setting an expectation about what, what can and can't be awarded in, in terms of the priority levels um, that, that we are at. But I appreciate that that then becomes attention and a pers you know, potentially seen as gatekeeping because you're almost um, putting people off applying before they, before they do apply. I, I don't think there's an easy answer. I, th I think it's just a, it, 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 it's one of the difficulties that we have with the Scottish Welfare Fund. Are there scenarios where, I, I know when you've got three local authorities represented, it may be better put to, to COSLA, I suppose, but are, are there any uh, scenarios you're aware of where a local authority has ran out of the fund, but someone would have otherwise qualified? Because I think there's a... Because it's not an open-ended mm -hmm. fund. No. I, think, I, I think there is. Uh, there have been examples of where um, local authorities have had to go to the level of high most compelling... Um, is how I think it's termed. Um, we haven't had that sort of um, scenario, but that is purely down to the budgetary constraints, essentially, in those individual cases, I think, I believe. Yes, McCandy, yeah. Thank you, Fabina. Um, yes, in terms of discretion, I think discretion is really important. Um, if we have a straitjacket approach to this, it won't meet individual need. So I think it's really important that we pause and think about the question mark over discretion. Um, we've seen systems in the past where it has been very rule-based and people just people's lives just don't fit into that. Um, this is the most vulnerable people in society that we're talking about here and we're trying to help and serve and help them through that um, crisis or that immediate need. Um, in terms of Highland, we've had 146 first-year reviews um, in terms of the Scottish Welfare Fund. So that's 0.02% of the number of applications that we received. And of that 146, we overturned about 50% of our decisions um, because that's a different decision maker looking at the original decision and the application and the information that's before them. And I think that's a very important point to stress that the guidance is very clear for local authorities. You make a decision on the information that's before you. You don't go chasing information and delay payment for people because it's really important to make that payment as quickly as possible and to make the decision as quickly as possible because if it's a refusal, it's really important that individual can find some other way of meeting the need and meeting the immediate crisis. And the final uh, question. Um, to try and identify the disparity then in local authorities in terms of decision making that's been suggested, uh, do you think that publishing information about um, things like who's applying for awards and the granting of awards might help show the picture across the country and identify where there might be um, unexplained variations? Clarity. And I think, um, you know, being as, um, being as open as possible about the decision making. I, I had suggested in my submission that um, there might be um, scope for replicating some of the practice of the um, social fund inspectorate. Um, they, or, or as they were latterly called, the, the independent review service, who actually did publish almost digests of decisions, um, which under the old social fund, um, the local, th the uh, social fund decision makers um, had to take account of, but didn't always have to follow. Um, but it was always risky for um, the old DWP social fund to take that line, um, because ultimately the social fund inspectors could overturn the decision. But I think there's there's scope to maybe go a little bit further in terms of publishing digests of decisions and having those whether you wanted them to be binding or to be taken into account, you know, it's, it, it's an option, I would say, to try and um, improve that consistency across the board. Thank you very much. 
with Candy. Well, she's very important here, and we can all learn from transparent, being transparent about these things. It can only be a positive thing to um, put as much information as possible in the public domain. It would also be very good for SPSO to share more of the decisions that are made, because I think we could all learn from those decisions. Thank you. Are you happy, Pauline? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on to Mr Griffin. Thank you, Camilla. Um, good morning. I just had some questions around um, the budget allocations for the Scottish Welfare Fund. Just to ask members of the panel whether um, your respective local authorities are happy with the level of um, Scottish Welfare Fund in which has been allocated and whether any of your local authorities have taken the, the decision to, to top up using your own funds. Okay. Um, yes. um, so I get in my submission, that uh, the Glasgow City Council submission, sorry, would, would made the point about the, the allocation. And I think it's fair to say Glasgow has probably been most affected by the change in the distribution uh, that was implemented um, at the beginning of 2016-17. Prior, when the, when the fund was first introduced, the, the budget allocations of the 33 billion were, were based on historic spend um, that had been experienced by the Department for Work and Pensions. And at that point, Glasgow was actually allocated 25% of the, of the national budget. Um, it was recognised at that time that it probably would need to be looked at in terms of going forward. And I think the distribution methodology of SIMD, I don't think you can actually challenge that because it is you know, meant to reflect uh, obviously low income and we know that this is a fund that, that, that helps people on low incomes. Um, However, I think what, what is evident uh, is that the, the impact, uh, certainly for Glasgow, is that we're seeing, uh, you know, if it, the allocation in 1819, it was a phased allocation, so 16, 17, over the, the three years they're moving gradually, is that um, in 1819, Glasgow would have seen a 20% reduction in its, its budget allocation. So um, that's, as, and as can be seen in the statistics, that's, it's something we've managed in 16, 17, 17, 18, there has been an overspend that Glasgow has contributed to from its own funds by about a quarter of a million pounds. Um, certainly going into 18, 19, there was going to be a reduction of a further 700,000 and the council took the decision that that wasn't something that it felt could be sustained and, and, and as part of its budget, it, it decided that the budget should remain at the 17, 18 level, which I think in itself will still still be challenging. So I think your question was, are we, are we happy with the, the, the budget allocation? Um, I guess what I'm saying is, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with the basis of the distribution, but I think what the statistics and the evidence is showing is certainly for Glasgow, the level of allocation that we have uh, uh, through the distribution model is, is, is not sufficient to meet demand. Mr Mason, do you want to um, I think uh, Dundee City Council have also um, decided to supplement the core grant income by just under £200,000 um, this year as well as last year um, to keep it at the 2015-16 levels. Uh, I think our council sees it as, um, as, as, as it was mentioned earlier on, as um, spend to save. Um, it really does sort of um, you know, assist people moving into new tenancies in particular. Um, and potentially save um, money over time, um, both for the customer and for the council, potentially. So, um, from our point of view, I, again, I would echo um, Morag's comments about the SIMD. You can't really argue against that. Um, but we've, we saw a demand in those previous years, which we met, and we see the benefit in meeting those kind of levels of demand in the future. Ms. McCandy. Thank you. In Highlands, certainly, our budget's about 990,000, um, and we th anticipate that we will come in on budget, and um, we will manage the budget in a way that we do. Um, we also think that SIMD is, is the right way to measure this and distribute the fund, um, because it does it does meet, meet the, the poverty levels, and it does address um, people in need. Um, at this point in the year, um, we've spent about 78% of of where we should be in terms of community care grants, and we're slightly over in terms of community uh, crisis grants in terms of our spend against the profile to date. But we do anticipate coming in on budget. Okay. 
Are there any members of the panel aware of just how how common it is for other local authorities to, to be topping up or not? Across Scotland, yeah. um, I think it's, it's quite quite variable across Scotland. I don't have exact figures, but I think there is quite a mix. I don't know if you'll be able to answer this question either, whether it probably is a better place for COSA, but and previously there was a concern about the administration section of the Scottish Welfare Fund budget, um, and a concern that that didn't uh, reflect the, the costs for local authorities. And COSLA um, were undertaking a, a benchmarking exercise um, to, to try and give evidence to government as to why the, the administration budget wasn't enough to cover their costs. I don't know if any members of the panel know if that um, exercise was completed and if um, anything was, was published that would allow um, the committee to take that to, to the Scottish Government? I'm sorry, I don't know if it was ever published. Uh, certainly in Highland, our costs are 60%, our funding 60% of our actual costs. So we're managing that, we're funding, we're funding at 40%, which is the same as what we're funding for housing benefit and council tax reduction. So it's on similar levels, it's on par with what we get in terms of the funding levels we get from DWP as to what we get from Scottish Government for Scottish Welfare Fund. Um, if demand continues to grow as we're anticipating, there needs to be a conversation. We can't go on subsidising uh, the administration of the scheme, but we are coping with it at the moment. Um, also subsidises the scheme, but also in different ways. Um, so um, although um, our administration grant um, doesn't um, cover staff costs completely within the Scottish Welfare Fund team, um, there's also the added um, cost of putting in this model. Um, so I suppose from an advice services point of view, um, we've almost um, linked our advice services into our Scottish Welfare Fund um, team um, to provide those handoffs and to try and solve problems on a longer term basis than rather than just meet the demand and be transactional at the point of crisis. Um, so there is a cost really in that, in, in putting services and linking those services up. Um, Yes, Johnson, yeah. Just very briefly, in terms of Glasgow, the administration allocation was uh, at the very beginning was was something that we worked within and that wasn't really an issue. So we weren't closely engaged with COSLA in those discussions on administration. It didn't affect Glasgow to the same extent it affected other local authorities. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. McPherson. Um, pulling together what you've been talking about now and, and, and what was touched on at the beginning, I just wondered... Um, Mr. Mason, and Ms. Johnson, if you could just talk about how has demand increased over that period significantly, where you've had increased costs, or I think are you uh, able to touch on? I think from from our point of view, true. we've seen um, it's quite interesting because our, our Scottish Welfare Fund um, crisis grant um, levels have gone down, and this is prior to um, the. Uh, universal full service um, coming in to Dundee in November. Um, so we started to see a trend and we've asked um, Scottish Government to perhaps make use of researchers to try and explain that, but we, we, we hope that it is due to the model and the fact that we're actually engaging with people on a longer term basis and looking at income maximisation, which I think is, you can't really, from my point of view, run Scottish Welfare Fund without looking at income maximisation, particularly in crisis grant cases. Um, the, the benefit of that, of course, is that we've been able to buy our money into our community care grant budget and provide more um, help for people moving into new properties and setting up sustainable tenancies. So it's... Um, I, I, I sort of hesitate to say that it's, it's working as we planned it, but that is the hope that we can we can see what the, the reasons are for those those shifts in demand from from crisis grants in particular. Um, hopefully, it is positive in the way that I've, I've outlined. Um, I think the experience in Glasgow is, is different from Dundee. Um, obviously, we now have like almost five years of uh, trains, if you like, for the Scottish Welfare Fund. But I actually don't think that's even enough now to try and in, in, interpret 
what's happening. Um, certainly between 1516 and 1617, Glasgow saw a significant increase in the number of crisis grant applications. Um, er, er, an, for that. Well, our analysis of that suggested in the main um, it was uh, sanctions related. It was a number of uh, sanctions that were being applied. There were, there were also some um, as a result of asylum seeker refugees and also, um, oh, sorry, I've forgotten what the, the third one was. It'll, it'll come back to me. Um, what I was going to say, I think in terms of the, the, the sanctions, um, issue. One of the things that uh, we did set up at that point then to try and address that, because some of the work that the welfare rights officers in Glasgow had done, I'm sure, sure this was um, national as well, is recognising that lots of people who were sanctioned didn't actually appeal their sanction and evidence showed that actually if you did appeal your sanction you were very likely to be successful. So one of the measures that we did put in place was if someone did apply for a crisis grant and it, it, we were able to see it was as a result of a sanction, we would um, refer them to our welfare rights advisors for them to take on, if you like, their sanctions case. And However, even uptaking that, I think, was, was slow. It's something that we're continuing to do, um, but I think that was slow. Um, and sorry, the third area, again, although we're not at full rollout, we did see more people applying because of universal credit, which is, I think, why I said at the beginning, we are still quite concerned about universal credit and the impact that it might have, um, because we saw that, that big increase over, over those two years. But I think there is just this underlying um, increase in demand um, it, it will be to the reasons that have been mentioned before in, in, in terms of low incomes. Um, s separately but linked, one of the things that Glasgow is doing is to prepare for obviously universal credit rollout is to look at that broad range of services that are available across the city um, that, that would support people moving into that new benefit and to try and, and link that up. And the Scottish Welfare Fund will be a part of that as as will lots of the services um, that we provide. Um, and again, the council is um, uh, investing about £2 million. It's planning to invest £2 million in that service. So I think it will be interesting to see, um, you know, and we will, we will track what happens, you know, over the next six months, 18 months with the rollout of universal credit and how that impacts the Scottish Welfare Fund and whether those measures the council is putting in place elsewhere um, hopefully will have a positive impact, but we'll need to, to measure that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions? From the committee. No, um, can I thank you all for your attendance at the committee this morning and um, it's really um, useful for us in this ongoing piece of work so thank you very much and we now move into private session.